the answer to your question is, as a professor listening to sometimes 15 sermons a week, I began to sense the common factors of oral clarity. And once I sensed them, I not only taught them, it was also my growth because I became intentional about bringing them into all of my preaching from that point on. Hey, welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast, episode 231. I'm your host, Mike Neglia, and the voice that you just heard is our guest for this week, Dr. Don Sanukian. Here's something that all of us know. Vague generalities, opaque, broad examples, and milky, imprecise application often falls short of the clarity that we're hoping for as we stand and deliver and proclaim God's word. Dr. Sanukian's passion is helping preachers grow in oral clarity and establishing relevance through real, vivid, embodied examples. This guy's got doctorates in theology and communication, and he served for more than 14 years as a senior pastor. And so Dr. Sanukian brings both scholarship and experience to his classroom at Biola University, where he serves as the professor emeritus of Christian ministry and leadership. And, and you know what? Because of that, I know you're really going to enjoy this interview. But before I get out of your way, I do want to welcome all the new listeners to this show. Um, we've had this massive spike in downloads over the past few weeks, and I'm not sure exactly how you found out about the show or where you came from, but once again, let me say welcome. Uh, feel free to connect more on social media. We've got a Twitter account, Instagram account, and Facebook, and I post a daily preaching encouragement. Uh, and if that's not enough, uh, if you want to take things to the next level, you can also request to join our Facebook private group. It's a community of preachers and Bible nerds. We talk about the episodes and related issues connected to our personal study and public proclamation of God's word. So I hope to see you there. All right, here's Dr. Don Sanukian with oral clarity and establishing relevance by rummaging through people's lives. Hey, welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast. I'm speaking with Don Sanukian, and uh, we're going to talk about preaching. We're going to talk about um, oral clarity, establishing relevance, and a bunch of other stuff. So how are you doing this morning, Don? I'm doing great. Well, it's early in the morning where I am. That's my best time of the day. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And it's afternoon for me, too. So <laughs> you're, you're catching me not at my best. But so... Um, I always like to start these interviews just by asking about like the first the first sermon that you ever preached. Do you remember the first time you taught the Bible in public? Uh, the, the first time that comes to memory was when I was middling in my middle years at seminary and the church that I was asked at was fairly small, but they asked me to start a couples class. And I became the regular Sunday school teacher of that couples class. And I basically prepared sermons for them every week. Uh, and that's where I kind of cut my teeth on the first sequential exposition of a Bible book. Uh, some of the messages were good. Some of them were, pet were repetitive. Uh, but I did the best I could. The Lord blessed it. The, the class grew. And people said, you know, it's worthwhile coming to hear you. So I was glad about that. Did you so you mentioned that you did like sequential exposition? Was that what they had in mind, or were they kind of hoping for more like couples based tips for dating? No, no, they were it was a Bible teaching church, uh, and they appreciated that I was trying to bring messages that were relevant to their lives as I moved through the sections of the scripture, yeah, uh, you know. If I had any contemporary ways of connecting it, it usually came out of our, my wife and I were young couples at the same time yeah. and connected it to the kind of things the young couples were facing. Okay. And and so that was your kind of interest, sorry, your entrance into this type of ministry. But I, I know that 
your life for the decades following have been essentially, I don't know if dominated is the right, is the right um, word to use, but incredibly devoted towards uh, preaching itself and then even equipping other teachers and preachers. Um, what's, what's your kind of preaching ministry or, or career look like since then? Uh, I've been the senior or lead pastor of three churches, uh, seven years in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, eight years in Austin, Texas. And then when I was on, uh, Scottsdale was when I finished my education. And then from Scottsdale as pastoring, I taught seven years, at, 10 years at Dallas Seminary, went back into pastoring in Austin, Texas for eight years, and then came to Talbot Seminary, where I've been a professor. While at Talbot, I also pastored a small ethnic Armenian church for about eight years. The Scottsdale and Austin were sort of middle-sized churches, somewhere between 600 and 900. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. I have been committed to studying the scriptures, preaching it, and hopefully trying to live by them personally. Yeah. And so this this might be too broad of a question, but I, I bet that you can can hone in on one or two things. So in in those decades since, I know that your teaching has probably improved and through the repetition and through increased study, like you've gotten better at it over years. Um, what are kind of like some moments of growth in you as a preacher um, over those years? A, there is a singular and a good answer to that question. When I started listening to sermons as a faculty member from students, you start hearing six sermons in a row within a three-hour period, okay? Okay. And then the next day you hear another six sermons. And all of a sudden you begin to notice things that you don't notice when you are only preaching one or two sermons a week. I remember the time that the students always turned in an outline, but I never looked at it because I wanted to listen to them, Joe Blow Christian coming fresh to church without any idea what's going to happen. And so I'm listening to this speaker, and I cannot follow him. I cannot track with him. And I think, I, in a minute, I've got to go up in front of the class, and we've got to have an interaction over what the kid just talked about, and I wouldn't know where to start. So I need some help. I'm going to turn over his outline and look at it to see if I can get some clue as to what he's trying to accomplish. I turn over the outline, and it is a good outline. It is crisp. It is consistent. It is logical. It is organized. The kid's got a first-class brain. Why couldn't I track with him? And then I discovered, ah, this Roman numeral. He didn't highlight it. He didn't let us know that he was moving from Roman number one to Roman number two. So I got up and I had something positive and constructive to say. Yeah. The next day, somebody else does the same thing. And I get up and I teach. I, I correct it again. And it finally dawns on me, instead of correcting it after they do it wrong, why don't I teach it before they ever start preaching? And that was the beginning of my understanding of the skills of oral clarity. Oral clarity is vastly different than written clarity. In written clarity, when you're reading something that's been written and it's your eye that's looking at it, you have all kinds of built-in aids to oral clarity. The biggest one is paragraph indentations. When your eye catches white space at the beginning of the line, hmm. your brain says to you, you are about to get a new thought. The, the sentence after the blank spot is always a topic sentence. It's always the lead sentence that tells you what that paragraph is about. So right away, you've gotten, I'm about to enter onto a new thought, and I've just read the new thought. None of that is available to you in oral clarity. In oral, there is no white space. Sure, yeah. And there's no way for a listener to pick out of 97 sentences which one is a key one that is introducing subordinate thoughts. At the end of a paragraph, your eye catches more white space. Your brain, say, brain says to you, end of that thought, get ready for another one. Other built-in aids to clarity. If you don't get it the first time, you can reread it. You can't do that when you're listening to somebody. I could go on. But anyway, the answer to your question is, as a professor listening to sometimes 15 sermons a week, I began to sense the common factors of oral clarity 
And once I sensed them, I not only taught them, it was also my growth because I became intentional about bringing them into all of my preaching from that point on. And in the most recent pastorate that I had here, one of the elders at one of the elders meeting, he said, my wife says, I like to listen to Pastor Don. I can always follow him. And so uh, that we've been able to bring oral clarity. Uh, I teach it to my students uh, and I hold their feet to the fire and they become better preachers because of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. You, you get fired up talking about that. I can tell, <laughs> I can tell it's important to you. I can tell it's yeah. important to you. Fascinating how a good set of notes and a good clear outline doesn't necessarily translate into a easy to understand or easy to follow sermon. Um, right. It, I, I mean, I know that if people want to learn more from you, they need to enroll in your class or, you know, um, but like how, how can th- that be communicated orally without like a slideshow transitioning from one point to the next, or how, how can these transitions from thought to thought be made orally that helps people to grasp? Uh, a little bit of a plug, which if somebody's interested in really looking at this ad, uh, I've written a textbook, which have been translated in a lot of different languages. It's called Invitation to Biblical Preaching. Yeah. Craigle puts it out. There is one or two chapters on oral clarity. And as far as I know, that's the only place you will find these because they are, these concepts are original with me. Uh, one of the endorsers in the blurb said the chapters on oral clarity are worth the price of the book. So as, that's nice. You know, I, I, <laughs> that's your chapter. Uh, so if somebody really wants to learn the, the skills of oral clarity, the most complete way would be to get that book and read those two chapters and make it a practice of, uh, intentionally using them. Now, to give you one idea of what's in there, whenever you come to a transition and you're moving from one major concept to another, you need to restate it. And by restate, I don't necessarily mean repeat. I mean immediately say the same thing, but use different words. Right away, find synonyms to convey the same thought you just mentioned. Before you go any further in the message, say the same thing, but use different language. I just did it three times. I said, I, the, I said the same thing three times. You're giving the listener's ear more than one chance to grasp the fact you are transitioning. So it might sound like not only does God uh, promise us a long life, he also promises us his presence during our life. It's not only how long we live, it's how well we live. It's not only that our days are extended, it's that those days are full of the presence of God. Now I have transitioned and I have restated the new point several times, and now I can go into the verse, which will talk about the presence of God. So restating, saying the same thing in different words immediately, is one clear way of basically giving the listener white space at the beginning of a paragraph. Mm. So that's one major concept. There are five others uh, that you can that I can talk that that are in the textbook that somebody can pick up. Yeah, well, I, we we've got a, a good relationship with uh, Craigle Publishing actually, and they've um, yeah we've, we've you are one of many uh, Craigle authors that have been on this podcast, and so we we love those guys. Shout out to Chris who usually hooks me up with these with these types of interviews. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, really enjoy so much of what Craigle puts out. Um, now I kind of had like I kind of joked about um, a slideshow um, transitioning from from point to point. Um, what what's your thought on the use of slides in guiding the thoughts from one section to the next? A similar question is: What are my thoughts on having bulletin inserts with printed outlines in the bulletin or available to the people when they come in? I'm not really good job using synonyms right there. <laughs> <laughs> you restated the question in a broader application of it. Thank you. I'm not really keen on it. Okay. Uh, if you ask people to fill in blanks, or if you ask them to look at the screen and you're tracking it forward with Roman numeral points on the screen, mm-hmm. it seems to me you're kind of moving the message toward an academic exercise. Uh, that's what we do in school. Mm -hmm. And we take notes, we fill in the blanks, we write things down because there's going to be a test and we want to make sure we get it right. And 
there's a distraction away from eye contact. There's a distraction away from my heart pouring into your heart. Mm. If I master the skills of oral clarity, I don't need slideshows and I don't need printed notes. Uh, I don't see Nathan going to King David saying, Nathan, King David, I want to tell you a story. There's this rancher and he had thousands of sheep and he killed them. David, you might want to take some notes on this. Or I brought a little illustrated book. You know, yeah. No, it's he's my clicking heart. through slides as he's talking. Yeah, it's it's a bit distracting. Uh, if it if they're taking notes, they get paranoid to make sure they got everything down right. Uh, it becomes academic, uh, and it dilutes from the passion of look at me and let my heart connect you with God's heart, and let's do business with God right now. And uh, now I do use PowerPoint, but I'll use it for a map. Put a map up there. Or if I'm going to refer to a scripture and I don't want them to turn to it because mm. I'm not going to take a whole lot of time with it. I just want to read it to see that it says something and then it comes down from the screen fairly quickly. Uh, I'll use it for diagrams, but I will not use it for outlines or to advance the progressional concepts of a message. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, I... Um... I, I watched a recent sermon that you, I, I recently watched a sermon that you preach on the, the faith of a mustard seed at the Talbot Chapel. And you were so incredibly present. You know, you had no notes. I don't know if you usually preach with notes or, or not, but like you were just a man with his Bible talking to people and like uh, addressing them. And it was, yeah, from your heart to their heart. And, uh, and that again, it was it, it's somewhat of a rare thing to to grasp people's attention that long with no bells nor whistles. You're just a man talking, but speaking well. And of course, there's the the divine aspect of all that of the spirit of God working in and through you and the congregation. But uh, do you think that a couple no, of comments? Just to yeah, 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 yeah. To add to what you've been saying, uh, number one, I do preach without notes because I think it does commit. It, gets better eye contact and better connection with the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, I have manuscripted that. So part of their tracking or part of their attentiveness is because my language has been carefully put down beforehand on paper and I mm -hmm. have tried to internalize it so that when I speak, uh, I can use the kind of words that are picturesque, uh, that will engage them. And they will also sense he's not blathering. He knows exactly what he wants to say. And all of those things very subtly communicate to the listener and cause an attentiveness. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to, to put, throw in that I, I, I do manuscript and I internalize and then I preach without notes and roughly 80% of what I wrote comes through. I don't, I can't yeah. memorize all of it, but most of it comes through as I wrote it. Yeah. And hopefully it's based on the verses in the Bible that you have in front of, you know, <laughs> like you're there without notes, but you're also holding a big book full of words and, yes. you know, textual preaching is connected to that. And so you're never too far from the next verse. Like that's right. Yeah, the yes. Bible has a flow, which yeah. I have in my sermon follow. And yes, so, yes. I, yes. I kind of can move through the concepts there. You're right. Yeah. Well, okay. So we with this this aspect of oral clarity, this aspect of like giving people like uh, that was a great compliment that the elder's wife gave that she was able to follow your sermons pretty consistently. Uh, what are the sorts of things that young students do or even established preachers do that make it hard for people to follow what they're saying? What are the what are the bad habits that many of us have developed that make it a rarity when someone is easy to follow? Sometimes they will give an introduction, which will end with a question such as, uh, what should we do when we are persecuted? Let's just take that. Sure. And then they will say, let's turn to a passage and then we, they will start off by saying, uh, we're going to see that Paul is traveling through Asia Minor. And the listener says, what does that have to do with what should we do when we're persecuted? You gave me a nice introduction. You turned me to the passage. And the passage is about an itinerary. It's not about anything else. Uh, 
So there is a disconnect between the introduction and the first Roman numeral. Mm -hmm. Instead, you've got You've got, if the listener is expecting you to answer a question, your first movement needs to answer that question. If you're not going to answer that question that the listener is expecting, you need to reset the listener's expectation. You need to, you need to, before you go into the passage, you need to say something like, we're going to answer the question, what should we do when we are persecuted? Before we answer that question, we are going to see how Paul on his travels, arrived at a city where he was intensely persecuted. Mm -hmm. Ah, now the listener says, okay, I don't expect you to answer the question. I expect you to first develop a scenario of persecution taking place. So that's one thing that a listener, the, the speaker knows I'm going to eventually answer the question I raised. They do not realize that there is an oral disconnect between what I set up in the introduction and how my body of my sermon is going to start. So that's one thing that, that they do that's uh, often in, uh, not well. Another thing that they do, they will ask a question. What should we do when we are persecuted? Let's read verses 14 to 19 to find out. And they will start reading. And the listener has never seen this passage before, hmm. is unfamiliar with how to read Bible verses, and cannot figure out the answer from the poor reading that the pastor is now doing going through the passage. And the listener says, I'm going to click you off. I'm going to turn you off. When you get done, you're going to tell me what you read. So basically, there is a wasted reading of the scripture because the, the speaker wants the listener to figure out the answer. The listener cannot do it. In fact, it took the speaker four commentaries and eight hours of study to come up with the answer to start with. The yes. listener can't come up with it in 10 seconds. So what the speaker should do, he should raise the question. And before he reads the passage, he should answer the question and tell the listener what he will find hmm. in the reading. All right. What should we do when we read? We're going to read that when we are persecuted, we should, first of all, not retaliate, turn the matter over to God, and accept whatever punishment comes to us when we are persecuted. Restate it. We should not try to resist whatever is happening. We should trust that God will work in the process and that through our receiving the, the harshness, some good will come out of it. Let's read verses 14 and 19 mm -hmm. to see that this is what we should do. And now when the listener reads, he reads intelligently. And I would even break that down. I would break it down and say, what should we do when we persecute? Paul is going to tell us three responses. And I would only give them the first response. And I would only read the one or two verses, 14 and 15, that deal with the first response. Don't give the listener the baggage of trying to remember three responses when you aren't going to get to the second and third one for another seven minutes. Just Go one at a time, but yeah. always before you read, tell the listener what is the concept that they're going to see in the reading. Speakers, if they would do that, they would be more clear. Yeah, and, and to sensitize the hearers, because, they're, yeah, they're hearing a big chunk of text that although the preacher is, I love how you pointed out, the preacher has been like living in this section all week long, and it makes sense to them because they've devoted so much time to it. And we're, we're kind of thrusting it upon the congregation for the very first time. So, of course, they're not going to notice the things that it took, as you mentioned, eight hours and three commentaries for you to see. So you sensitize it. That's, that's solid. That's gold. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you. You also, I've, I've heard you speak uh, elsewhere about like the need for oral clarity uh, coupled with like a need for establishing relevance. Um like not just saying things well, but showing or proving or highlighting the need that this text answers. Could you speak to us about it's like relevance and establishing it? Yeah. yeah. When I think in terms of contemporary relevance, I think in terms of scenarios or examples that come out of the experience of the listeners that I'm talking to. I distinguish 
application from illustration. And illustration is a story from some other part of life. An illustration is why geese always fly in a V, v pattern. An illustration is when I climbed Yosemite um, El Capitan. I, you actually can't go up El Capitan. Uh, that's an illustration that is outside the experience of my listeners. If I were to tell about a, a hot air balloon ride, probably none of my listeners have been in a hot air balloon ride. Uh, if I want to talk about a thrill, I need to pick a thrill that is a common experience for most of my listeners. So an application is where I try to find a situation either that they have lived through, are living through, or realistically could live through. For instance, if I say, well, maybe sometimes uh, you find that your commitment to integrity gets you in trouble with other people. Okay. Now that's a vague statement. It's very abstract. Mm -hmm. They'll say, yeah, yeah, okay. But I, then, but there's, but I always follow it up with, for example, mm. for instance, okay. And so I might tell us, I might give a scenario that realistically they could face. Somebody in your office is coming around taking a collection. They want to buy a present, a home warming gift for uh, a, a girl, a lady in your office who is going to move in with her boyfriend, and they want you to contribute to this. And you're suddenly faced with, do I want to put ten dollars in to buy a home? Uh, gift for a couple who are going to shack up together. No, my Christian integrity says they shouldn't be doing that and I shouldn't be encouraging it. If I say no when the person coming around collects, all of a sudden I'm a cheapskate in the office. I am now paying a price for my integrity. Okay. Now that's a concrete example. Mm, I will yeah. follow that up with three or four examples that cover different demographics. I gave you one from uh, the office. I will give one from a, a young mother. Okay. A young mother will not allow her children to go to the mountain cabin with her in-laws for a week. She will allow her children to go to the beach with her parents for a week. Why will she allow them to go with her parents and not to, to the mountain with her in-laws. Her parents are believers. Her father-in-law is not a believer. He has pornography in that mountain cabin. She doesn't want her young son seeing that pornography, not even sure she can trust her father-in-law with her 12-year-old daughter. Now, all of a sudden, there's another concrete example for a young mother. I'll give one for a teenager. So I, I'll always follow it up with concrete Pictures, pictures, visual images, a movie that can go on in the eyes of the listener yeah. as they say, yes, that's how it shows up in my life. That's relevance. It's contemporary connections to realistic situations in the lives of the people you're talking about. Yeah. That's when godliness takes place. Okay. Godliness never happens in abstractions. It always happens in details. Okay, so Don. You, as far as I know, you don't work in a work environment where they're taking collections for cohabitating couples. I'm sure the seminary is not doing such things. Nor are you a young mother concerned about the whereabouts of your 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 kids. How do you think of these these applications or these examples when they're so far from your experience? Like what? What allows you to speak about those things? Not allows. How how do you speak of those with such clarity when they're obviously not your own experience? Right. I know what my biblical concept is. Sometimes you will pay a price for your integrity or yeah. for your good things. Then I start visualizing different segments of my audience. I visualize, I got widows. I got grandmothers. Where in their life would they pay a price? Well, I did read that if you live together as people in your 80s, but don't get married, you both keep your own social security. I read that somewhere. I knew that. If you get married, one of you loses your social security. So if you do the godly thing, you'll pay a price. The government will cut your income in half. That one I picked up from my reading. So I mm -hmm. do read a news magazine. I listen to the news all the time. So part of that I get from there. Uh, now, I think of another way. Where else would a grandmother? I'm going to try to think of two or three. Well, suppose she has a granddaughter who is traveling through the city the grandmother lives to get to the city where the parents for the, of the granddaughter are. Uh, it's Christmas break. She wants to stay overnight with grandma. And, and she calls grandma up, can I stay overnight with you? Grandma says, yes. And the granddaughter says, can I bring a friend with me? And grandma says, well, of course, sure. Uh, what's your friend's name? 
Steve. Oh, oh, okay. Steve, uh, you can have your mother's bed upstairs. I'll fix up the couch for Steve downstairs. Grandma, Steve and I sleep in the same bed. Now grandma's got a problem. Okay. Now, see, what I'm doing is I'm visualizing where could this come up in her life. I'll do the same thing with a with a teenager. Uh, a teenager, where would he really pay a price for integrity? Uh, well, where, where, what goes on in his life? He's got parents. He's got classmates. He's got school situation. Where would he show up in a school situation? Uh, how about a classroom? Uh, ah, substitute teacher. Substitute teacher wants to collect an assignment that is due according to the lesson plan that the regular teacher left. And someone in the class says, no, 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 no. The teacher told us we could have another week on it. And everybody in the class chimes in. Yeah, we could have another week. Christian kid in the class, very tentatively raising mm-hmm. No, it's due today. He has now become a pariah uh, in front of the, in, the, in the eyes of the whole class for his Christian commitment. Concrete. Mate, will you tell that every Christian kid in the class, every Christian kid listening to you will say, Pastor, you live in my real world. You know, I don't know if I do that, Pastor, but you're right. I would pay a price if I did. So I just I just rummage. I rummage around in their yeah. life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, a, a yeah. young mother, a young mother. Oh, you got more. You are good at this. <laughs> You're really good at this. She's got, she not only has in-laws, uh, she's got, she's got a neighborhood. Okay. She, she wants, she's, she's good relationships within the neighborhood, but her daughter comes home with a, with a, a birthday invitation and it's five, six, seven miles away. And the mother calls up the, the mother of the birthday girl and says, oh, I'm going to bring my daughter. She's so excited. Uh, you know, rather than make a round trip, I'll be glad to stay and just help out with you. And the, the mother of the birthday girl says, oh, my, my sister's here. I don't need your help. Thanks for offering. Uh, and uh, she and then the, the mother says, well, what are, what are you planning for the birthday? Well, we're going to we're going to go to Chuck E. Cheese. And then after we go to Chuck E. Cheese, we're going to come back and we're going to watch a movie. Uh, oh, what movie are you going to watch? And she hears a movie that as far as she is concerned, she doesn't want her daughter to watch. It is inappropriate. And she gently says to the host mother, do you think that's suitable for kids that are 12 years old? Ah, you know, kids today, they they, they know everything. Uh, any chance that you might consider a different, hey lady, you don't want your kid to come. You don't have to, you don't have to come. And all of a sudden now, She has ostracized another mother in the school, and she has made her daughter angry with her because she cannot now go to that birthday party. All right, I'm rummaging around, and I'm just, I end up with more than I can use. I end up, at a certain point, I pick one or two for each demographic within my audience, and I let the the rest of them stay on the study notes uh, for it. But the answer to your question, I just rummage around. Wow, yeah, rummaging. Yeah. And, and and this is all like a mental exercise. I mean, obviously it comes from, let's say even decades of pastoring real people and then also living your own real experiences. But in some of them, like most of the ones that you mentioned are obviously outside of your own experience. So it's imagination. Is it memories? Um, do you ever consult with people and say, what does it look like for you as, as a disabled veteran? What are the, you know, do you, do you ever ask somebody specific things about their life? Or is it all just an internal practice? On a weekly basis, I have not done that, but I acknowledge it's a good process. Okay. Any pastor that can set up a Thursday group by the time he's done the study and put the flow together, if he can set up up a group of varied types of individuals and ask that question, that's terrific. For some reason, I've never done that. I I do from my from my pastoring uh, over several decades. I have picked up a lot of things. Uh, for instance, this last Sunday, I talked about what is the unforgivable sin. And I said, is it sexually molesting a younger person so that they are emotionally and psychologically damaged for the rest of their life? Is it giving somebody a venereal disease so they can never bury children? Both of those have come out of my pastoral experience. Okay. Uh, so now I I regularly made it a, a business. A, practice of taking businessmen out to lunch. And sometimes I would go to their place of work, but I would always ask them questions about their career, their work environment, and I would learn a lot about it. And that would eventually find its way into sermons, though I would never connect it concretely to anybody uh, so that they would know. So it's a combination of several things. Uh, I, yeah. 
I, I read, I've pastored and counseled, and I've talked with people, uh, and then I just use my own knowledge of what the world is like. Yeah. Well, that's super, super encouraging. And, and it's nice for each of those two things you've been talking about, the, the clarity piece and the relevance piece, each of those things, like they have kind of a, a, a low entry point. Like there's not a preacher listening to this who can't implement some of this this coming Sunday. Like there's, there's what, what are ways that a person yeah. could say, I'd like to take a tiny step towards this yeah. apart from buying your book from Kriegel Publishing. <laughs> have you asked the question again, but in addition to having a biblical grasp of the passage as a preacher, mm-hmm. oral clarity and specific concrete visual applications are the two things that will keep the listeners wrapped, attentive with you all the way through because they enable them to track and you are in their lives and they are just going to hang on every word. Now ask your question. (laughs) Well, yeah, (laughs) the the question is like, what is the small starting step? You know, someone's been listening to this podcast and they are convicted, you know, Oh Lord, I haven't done this, you know, and what's, what's a way to begin to do this? Again, I think you've got kind of a masterful way of establishing relevance and you've kind of demonstrated some of it right there, but how can somebody just get a little bit more into this okay. uh, this coming Sunday? All right. The biggest step they can take toward our clarity is this. Restate every critical sentence yeah. in your message. There's probably 12 or 15 of them. They are transitions. They are Roman numerals. They are major subpoints. Every time you come to a new concept or every time you come to a structural kind of sentence which gives the flow or organization of the pastors. A critical sentence, restate it. Say it again two or three times using different language every time. If you'll do that, you have taken the biggest step toward oral clarity that you can take. Now, in terms of contemporary applications, you just got to rummage around in individual people's lives. I sometimes find it helpful to start with my life. Where have I faced it? Where am I facing it? Where could I face it? Uh, you know, but I've got to make sure that the experience that I come up with is one that is common to my listeners. Uh, but it's so easy. It's so easy for any preacher. Who's he got in front of him? He's got he's got widows. He's got young mothers. He's got college students. He's got singles. Where would a single face, you know, uh, persecution or face pay a price for integrity? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just try to imagine where that would show up in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, I, I didn't preach this past Sunday. Um, I, I try to take at least one, one Sunday off, uh, these days and, and, but I'm also like intensely involved in in the process. Like I love this stuff, you know? And then, you know, I, I kind of would get the notes, uh, from the preacher on the day before or, Ideally, a few days before, but oftentimes it's Saturday morning that I'd get them. And there was kind of the the, the introduction section was blank, and you know I was speaking to the the preacher about you know like, hey, listen for this introduction, like you want to go, you want to start off by going into their world and then dragging them into the the world of the text that you're about to about to do. Um, yes. Oftentimes. I get nervous when I when I see in someone's notes just kind of a blank that says like illustrate here or tell a story here because if it's thought of in the spur of the moment or like the easiest thing to always do is to tell a cute story about your kids or talk about a, an experience that you had when you were in college because those, that's what's easiest it's just like this happened in my life so I'll talk about it but I'm trying to encourage even that particular preacher like stop telling stories about yourself talk about something that they can relate to and then bring them into it yeah. um and that's, I guess I wouldn't use this. I, I'm not using this language, but now I will of establishing relevance. Thank you for giving me more, more vocabulary. Uh, even worse introductions is one which is, goes into ancient history. And re- it starts out, well, we've been tracing Paul's travels through the, the, the mm. world. And we saw that he was in Thessalonica last week. And this week we're going to see as he goes into another city, which is very famous in the Roman world. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I didn't come to church for geography yeah. or, for, you know, it has, that has no connection to my life. Yeah. It said, what is the issue? Uh, what 
I often find this is a helpful way to get a handle on the passage. What question is this passage answering for us? God is answering some question that we might ask him in our life. This passage is giving us the answer. Uh, Paul is asking, Paul is, whatever Paul's doing, the passage is going to answer a question that I need to know in my life. What is that question? And sometimes that's the question I will use in the introduction. Ah, okay. So raise it, yeah, and then allowing the text itself to answer that question. Okay. And, and stick with me, folks, because in these next few minutes, we're going to see how God's word answers this problem. Yeah. Okay. And I will also I will also give them a little bit of the sense of the hunks that might be faced. I will say we're going to see that Paul faces this issue. We're going to see what the answer is, and then we're going to see that if we will do the answer, we're going to see what good benefit will occur. I have now pre-hunked mm -hmm. the flow of the major points, uh, and that again helps them now to track with me. They know the big strokes that are going to come. Yeah. And I would have restated those big strokes when I said them at the start. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. What one final thing about my review of this other guy's notes. Yeah. Um, you know, he he had good stuff in there. And then I I wrote in the comments like, like, you know, this is good. This is too good to only say once. Like make sure that you say it here. And then say it again here, and then say it again here, because it's so good. If you say it once, it's not going to get remembered. But if you hook it here, and then there, and then there, there's a chance that people might. I would add to that. I, okay, I, I, I agree. There are some messages where whatever my theme sentence is, it yeah. gets stated at various points. I would say that when I say state it the first time, I would restate it right then in different words. And when I came to where it should appear the second time, I would use that trilogy of sentences again. Yeah. Uh, and that's a way of, of imprinting it. Yeah. So, so in my words, it's like, it's too good to only say once. And then you would say, it's too good to only say in one way once. You should say that's it in multiple ways, multiple times. That's it. That's good. You got thanks, it. Thanks, I Professor. Yeah, I'm, I said, <laughs> I'm trying to be a good student. Okay, final final question. So, yeah, so Don, like, how are you currently trying to improve as, as a preacher? Are you trying to get better in any ways? And what's like a, a growth that you're leaning into right now? I have always felt that my conclusions were my weakest part. Uh, usually, I'm manuscripting it at the end of the week and at the end of seven hours of manuscripting, and it's kind of like review and sit down, which is a very terrible conclusion, you know, summarize and quit. And so I'm, I'm trying to have some way of conclude, you know, I'm trying to, one of my colleagues said, I discover I've got something really good early on, and I'll say, I'm going to take it away, and I'm going to put it in the conclusion. Well, I thought that was a good suggestion. He, he saves something that fits, but he puts it at the end. Uh, I, I just need to work on my conclusions. And so, yeah, I'm trying to be a little bit more intentional about, you know, getting out of the message with some sort of encouragement or some sort of thoughtful uh, exhortation. I don't know. Exhortation. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I just need to put the time in to make one of them happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I I recently read the short little book from Jonathan Pennington called "Small Preaching." Have you read it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Short little essays, and like there there was one little essay called "The First Minute of Your Sermon" that was so good, and then the next the next essay was called "The Last Minute of Your Sermon," and just like a real punchy little uh, reminder towards the yeah. value of just concluding well. And uh, we're all working on it. And it's, it's encouraging to hear that even you, who who we can and should be learning from, um, you still are trying to improve. And that's even a good a good role model for uh, those, those of us who are younger, just getting started. Um, there's always a learning process. So let's conclude, right? <laughs> so let's review what we've said. Thank you for telling us about your <laughs> first sermon that you ever did, the growth since then, oral clarity and establishing relevance. And now may the Lord bless you. <laughs> There's donuts in the hall. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, let me pray. Let me pray. That's probably uh, it. 
Lord, thanks. Thanks for just a fun time together with Mike. Thanks for the work he's doing. Bless his ministry, uh, both in his church and in his attempt to give to other people uh, good thoughts about preaching. Thanks for the joy of the common calling that we have. And most of all, thank you for your presence in our life because of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, And hey, thank you so much for that great conversation. Thanks to you for listening all the way to the end. There were some real gems in there, right? So be sure to check out the show notes for links to the books and the resources that have been mentioned throughout this conversation. Uh, Before I go, just want to say mark your calendar for our upcoming in-person training event. Uh, October 14th and 15th in Boise, Idaho. Uh, Registration is already open and the early bird discount is still available. Uh, You can find more details out about that training event. You can find old episodes and more at expositorscollective.com. God bless. Have a great week. I hope that this episode and all that we do helps you to grow in your personal study and public proclamation of God's word.